Well, I am going to go ahead and, and get started. Uh, I'm uh, Roseanne Hansen. Welcome, everyone. I'm uh, the uh, nature journalist and author of Nature Journaling for a Wildlife. And I'm super happy that you are all here to our first micro safari. We've been doing some virtual field trips, but this is our first, um, what I call, a micro safari because we won't be going huge distances the whole time. We're gonna gonna do something a little differently uh, by by staying in one place for longer. So it should be a lot of fun. And let me introduce uh, Grace Howard. Grace, uh, pop Hi. pop up. So. Hi everyone. Grace will be assisting me uh, as as the tech experts. And, um, um, right, so let's, let's get started. So our goal, as I said, in this workshop is to hunker down in one place and learn about everything in that area as much as we can and to observe intently. And our subject is going to be milkweeds and monarchs and then a lot of other creatures that also uh, inhabit the same field. So we'll start with that and then if we have time we might uh, end up getting to do a quick jump down to Mexico to take a look at where monarchs spend the winter. So we'll, uh, we'll try to make sure I get through all of that. Uh, I'm a minimalist nature journaler so that means um, I really don't use a lot of different uh, pens and, and uh, watercolor. I tend to uh, carry my, my notebook with me and go and sit down in one place or walk and observe and take notes and do all my sketching as I go. So that's what I'm going to do today is I'll be focusing on showing you how I pick what I, I might do, maybe a couple different views, some zoom in, zoom out kind of things. Uh, and um, it's fun too if um, I'll be stopping and if somebody else has some cool ideas, we'll, we'll take some cool ideas from, from everybody else too. because as many people as there are on this workshop will all have a different way of viewing things. And it's really fun to see um, and hear what, what, that it, what that is. Uh, so I tend to do, you know, maybe 80, 90% of my sketches uh, in my notebook in the field, and then maybe finish, like if I'm on a field trip, I'll finish back in camp at night or um, back at home if I'm on a day trip. And, um, so we're going to focus on, I always try to say we focus on, um, we're not doing studio drawing. We're not doing perfect renderings here. We're sketching to get down details, to observe. We're, we're sketching to, to, to learn something. So we're drawing to learn, not learning to draw so much. So don't focus too much on absolutely perfection, right? Um, and, and I'm going to just keep emphasizing that. Welcome again to our micro monarch safari. A little bit about me if you're new to my workshops. Uh, I am, I've been a, a nature journaler. I've been keeping field notes and nature journals, field notes for my science background um, for over 30, 35 years, 40 years almost. And uh, I am a naturalist and a writer by background and my work. I'm an author and uh, I currently am the art and science program coordinator for the University of Arizona's laboratory, uh, desert laboratory on Tumamoc Hill. And I run my workshops and uh, teach through my own field arts institute at our exploringoverland.com. And I really, really love to help people explore the world through the field arts, through sketching, writing, observing, and uh, all sorts of, of really kind of low-tech ways. So let's talk a little bit about monarch butterflies. It's an absolutely fascinating uh, uh, insect as we're going to find out. Uh, we'll be starting in Yosemite, the green dot on, on the map in, on the, the uh, west coast. And that's, that's where uh, the, a west coast population lives. And then there's also an east coast population of, of monarchs. Interestingly, you'll see on that map, 
the question marks because the Western monarch population is not as well known and studied. I was really surprised that we still don't really know for sure their exact migration route uh, and where they move in the West. Uh, so in the East, we know quite a bit. There's been much more uh, studies of, of the Eastern migration. So you'll see that they, the monarchs come down to Mexico in the fall and then they overwinter. And we'll take a look at some of their habitat and, and um, the features of, of both, both their summer and their winter. So little, some details about uh, the monarch butterfly. It's um, Danaus plexippus is the uh, genus and species. And it's in the subfamily Danaeinae, which are also called brushfoot or milkweed butterflies. And they're called brushfoot because they have reduced four um, legs that have, that have um, a lot of bristles on them. So they end up looking like they have little brushes on the ends of their four, four legs um, and milkweed because they, they depend on milkweeds for, for their survival. So milkweeds, excuse me, <laughs> monarchs need a diversity of flowering plants, um, including milkweeds, um, to fuel their flights and to survive and reproduce. Uh, the females lay their eggs on any of the nine milkweed species in North America, but they do have favorites, ones, ones that are favored. And interestingly, the, the milkweeds have a, a, a toxin in them called, it's in the family of um, cardenoloid, cardenolides, um, which is toxic to most other animals, but both the, the, um, the caterpillar can feed on that and assimilate, not only assimilate the toxin, but they, they incorporate it into their body. So they become toxic to predators, which is really cool. Uh, sadly, uh, Western and Eastern monarch butterfly populations are, are down 99.4% since the 1980s. And that's largely due to habitat loss and pesticides. So we'll be um, focusing a little bit on that too today. So in, their Mex in the Mexican highlands where they spend the winter, uh, there is a, a large world heritage site uh, just uh, northwest of Mexico City. And it is uh, La Reserva de Biosfera de la Mariposa Monarca. And it is incredibly important, but it's also at risk. Uh, imagine the millions and millions of butterflies um, spending the, the winter here. They, they cluster together for warmth because it's quite high. Um, we'll be um, uh, actually, I forgot to double check. Grace, did you load the metadata? So uh, for our nature journaling, Grace is going to load a PDF of all of our, um, in the chat, she'll put our um, metadata and nature data. Um, so this will have the locations, the elevation of the, the different places that we're going to be going. Well, it's just two places, but, but the Yosemite Valley and the, the Mexican Highland in La Reserva. So it's uh, the Mexican Highlands here where they spend the winter is really high. It's like eight, almost 8,900, 9,000 feet. So they have to cluster together to, to stay warm. They cluster in pine and oyamel trees. And all of this information is in the PDF that Grace just shared. So you don't have to like scribble it all down right now. You'll have it um, for, your, for your notebooks when we get into the, the actual um, field trip part. Next is I'm going to take you to Ye uh, Yosemite and we will spend uh, a few minutes just observing, being in one place and then after that, I'm going to stop uh, in mid, mid field trip as it were, and we're going to then switch to uh, doing our, our field journals, our notebooks. And you'll, I'll show you what I would sketch and you know, you by all means, you know, pick something else, but we'll bounce back and forth between being on our field trip and uh, being uh, working in our journals. All right, here we go. And uh, we are 
we, we started in Australia because that's where my last field trip was. And here we are entering the Yosemite Valley, which is one of the most amazing places on earth. And we are in a field next to the Merced River. I'm gonna pause here for a moment. And what the purpose of our field trip here is, is, is we've come, come down into the Yosemite Valley and we found this field full of milkweed. And the most common milk, milkweed in you know, the Yosemite Valley is um, the showy milkweed, it's called uh, Asclepius speciosa. And so we're just noticed tons of, of insect activity, all kinds of activity actually uh, in this field. It's a big open field next to the river um, because milkweed does like uh, disturbed places. Uh, and so it gets flooded here and, and lots of activity. So we're gonna just hunker down in this field and observe as closely as we can everything that's happening around us. Not just the monarchs, there's a lot of monarchs, but there's a lot of other insects too. So pay attention to what you're seeing and then we will come back um, to this when we get to our notebooks and figure out what we might record. So I'm seeing lots of different bees. There's our monarch, monarch coming through. So carpenter type bees, bumblebees. Oh, I'm gonna pause here. This is a super cool beetle. So this is called the blue milkweed beetle and it's got a super cool species name and uh, grace can put these in the the chat for you so you can spell it it's um chrysocus cobaltinus so cobalt so it is the blue milkweed beetle and like the monarch this beetle can eat the plant parts of the milkweed and process the toxins and it is also toxic to predators. So that's another super cool. So there's an ant species. And look at that monarch. Look at the fuzzy, furry, feathery bits on the back and those really developed spots. That's really characteristic. The other thing to notice I want to pay attention to a lot is how monarchs fly, their flight pattern. Here's a little hummingbird, probably a female, can't tell what species. Lots of bees, honey bees. Look at the, the pollen on their legs and the pollen sacs. More beetles, more of those large, um, you know, we might call them bumblebee as a, as a type of silly. <laughs> and these iridescent beetles are just outrageously beautiful. Um, also notice the, oh, here's a Western tiger swallowtail. Notice the uh, different coloring on the, the monarch wings when you see them flying. Sometimes, um, especially from the underside, the rear wings are, <laughs> that was awesome. Um, the rear wings are lighter color, there you go, than, than the, the fore wings, especially underside. Oh, that was awesome. Did everyone see that? I'm gonna pause that and maybe play it again because we were looking at the wings, because this is a safari, right? So there's predators too. So look what just grabbed the monarch. Yep, that was, um, that was lunch there for that praying mantis. This, I think this is a type of moth called the, um, the nine spotted moth, but I'll have to look that up later. I'm not positive. That was, not quite enough information, but I would take notes on that in my journal. That was a sphinx moth. One thing I always say about monarchs is that they have a, a really flouncy, floppy flight. These videos are slowed down, it's a different frame rate, but they still, when, when they, they fly, when you see them fly through your yard, they, they have, you know, here's a good example of it. Flap, 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 up, they stop flapping, they glide, flap, flap, flap up and glide. So one fun thing to do 
would be to observe and maybe count how many flaps um, before I glide. Uh, I just in looking here, I was noticing it's like three to four maximum. So that would be another fun thing to do in your journal, sitting in a field like this, is taking um, a poll, as it were, um, of, of how many flaps before they glide. And now here's a monarch caterpillar. Um, that's what they look like. Notice it's hard to tell which is the head and which is the rear because they have a false head at the rear, which you're seeing right here at the top. Um, I'm going to go back there because we're going to pause here. There. See the, the false head there. Uh, that's to um, confuse predators. So we've just observed a ton. You know, we would normally in a, in a, a field trip like this, we would, we would spend, you know, quite a bit of time before we even really got into our journals uh, observing and just getting a good handle on what's going on rather than just zooming down the trail and bypassing this, this meadow, we would spend quite a bit of time. So now what I'm going to do is show you my, my field notebook, my nature journal, and how I would start out and, and maybe what I would do um, online. Those of you who taken my classes or, or my, my workshops um, in the past, this is, um, this is my, my field notebook, a very, um, it's, well, I think it's 20, 20 some odd years old now. It's a leather, simple self-made leather um, notebook that I lace my own uh, good watercolor paper in. And I use a, a little um, coroplast palette where I put my paint kit and water. Uh, I'm going to remove that for this sketching though because I can't use it that way for the demos. Um, oh, far away? Or did I go on the wrong page? Were you talking to me, Grace? Was that you? Oh, there's part. Ah, she went away. Or someone might need to be muted. All right. So prior to a, a field trip, what I generally do, whether it's a day trip or a, 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 a long camping trip or, or even a really long month long overland trip, uh, is, is I'll look up information about where I'm going and I'll sometimes do it before I leave, but most often, you know, the first day I'm someplace, I will sit down and ground myself literally <laughs> uh, by, by putting my, my metadata, the, all the important information about where I am, what the weather is, you know, somewhere on my page. And for me, it's always at the top. And I do this grid on purpose, um, as, as you guys who have my book or my classes know, um, because it, it helps me warm up. I don't use a ruler. And sometimes it's really wonky wobbly. But you can see here, um, you have this information in your PDF. But, um, you know, I put the, the longitude and latitude of Yosemite, that it was clear, which is this symbol. There's a 12 mile per hour slight breeze is what this represents from, from the south, southwest. And the elevation and what the sunrise, sunset and all that was. Um, it's going to be hot in Yosemite today, isn't it? So, uh, but it was a beautiful early fall day. This is kind of how I warm up and get get my prose started because it's not always all about the, the perfect pretty pictures. Um, and we're in a field of milkweed next to the Merced River and the Yosemite Valley. And there's tons of insect activity. So that's how I start. So here I am sitting in the field. But what I might want to do just to sort of, I, I, I like to give an overview um, since we're trying to learn about monarchs, especially as one of our, our goals of our field trip, is I might do a little maybe a, a, a map down the side here before I even do anything else of maybe I'll pull out a little bit of, of that North America map just to really, really a quick sketch. Nothing super um, uh, detailed, but just to give me a, a good, uh, grounding, you know, uh, overview. 
So I'm just going to really lightly. Here's Baja. And I could, you know, I could go crazy in detail here, but I'm, I'm not going to trying to get the proportions right, but you know, it's okay if I don't. And All right, so, you know, we all sort of recognize this as, as, as North America. And so Yosemite is going to be like right about here. So let's do a, let's have fun and I'm going to mark it with a, a, a little butterfly symbol. There. And then our Mexican highlands are down here. Let's place them right about here. Again, let's let's put a little oh, little butterfly symbol. There and um so we might even say, you know, like, well, uh just to, to ground us, I might say this is Los Angeles. And um, and here's uh, Mexico City, more or less. Actually, it's kind of yeah, that's that's good enough, I think, for for what we're doing. And I might say Pacific Ocean. And this is all great for warming up too. So this is the um, Mexican Highlands. And this is Yosemite. All right. So this gives me a nice little side map here. And later I could go in and, you know, maybe color the ocean blue and, and put some, um, some color in the, the monarch um, and have fun with that. But one of the things I, I noticed about the uh, we, the reason we stopped in that field was was the field of milkweeds. So next thing I might do is is kind of try to represent the feeling of that field full of, of milkweeds. Um, that's that's what I would do. But by all means, you know, something thinking about my page and and things I would write and and do. So maybe across here. I might might do this is where I might do some representation of of these milkweeds. Let's put some markers in here or some this like place markers where I'm going to maybe put some milkweeds. I'm not going to get super detailed here. I'm going to just represent that these are milkweeds here. And then I might be able to um, do a, a zoom in and, and do um, maybe just the flower up, up here. But let's do, to do the flower heads, I would, I would kind of show, I'm not going to try to draw everything. So I'm, I'm doing these representations by doing these globes. And I might do a few of the, the stars. Now the, um, the milkweed flowers have, have five uh, petals on them. So I'm wanting to just show, see how I'm just not filling it all the way in, then I can go in and do some, some color later. And notice the big, big leaves and they're, they're paired. And they sort of alternate around the um, 
So I'm going to try to, to get that, show that here. And they're in a field of grass, so that's what I'm showing here with just kind of messy grassy lines. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it. Um, again, what I'm trying to do is show there's a lot of milkweed in this, this field. I'm carrying over to the other side, so I'm kind of doing a double page here. Um, Milkweeds are really, really cool plants. I hope everyone, if you can plant them in your garden, you will do so. Kind of fun, messy plants. So that's a good start. And then what I will definitely want to do is, is uh, identify this as Asclepius um, speciosa, uh, most likely that's what it is. And it's um, showy. milkweed. And then what I might do is um, show the flower, which is really interesting. I'm going to do one flower head here. Um, I'm just going to start it out. It's really, really complicated. So this would be a really fun thing when you're out to um, spent quite a bit of time really studying this and and blowing it up and drawing it in detail in your 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 notebook i'm going to focus on just one here and i'm blowing it up quite a bit they sort of it's really cool how they sort of float <laughs> above the uh, anthers, so let's see. And they're sort of heart-shaped. Oh, did I leave enough room? Oop, wobbly ring. So that's a, a good beginning sketch. And I can go in and um, with uh, watercolor in a bit. And one thing when you're doing these details is we want to say, well, first of all, how tall are these? So I think these milkweed plants are pretty robust. So um, this is around, let's just say, these are about 30 inches tall. That's how you show kind of height. And then this, in, in terms of the blown up size, I think this is about probably double. So I'm going to say times two, meaning it's twice as big on the page than it is in person. Um, so I'm going I'm to leave that and not do too much other detail. 
but as you can see, we, we really got quite a bit just off the bat here. And I might write a little bit more about um, in here about the, the details of the, of the milkweed. So what would I do next? Well, I think we have to do the monarch, right? So what I'll do is I'll do a mostly, try to do a, a life, life size monarch. And I think I'll put it right up here. Let's um, call him up there. So how do we start, how do we get these, these shapes and proportions? Um, I'll start with the body. And I'm just gonna do a very, just, a, just a, a long oval right now. I'm not gonna worry about details yet. And then, um, so it's a little head. So that I, I that's what I'm gonna base my, my structure on now, whoops. Um, let me, there, now you can see that a little better um, because I'm going really, really light right now. Um, the other ones I just jumped in and did full ink. So now I'm, I'm just really light. And what I'm gonna do is, is use my little technique where um, I, I learned from Mark Tarot Holmes, this dot mapping. So there's the beginning of the, the wings there. Uh, I wanna mark that. And then to get my proportions right, I, I actually, you know, I'm, I'm going to use that, try to, try to see if I was, if I had one in front of me live or whatever, I'm going to try to see just what the proportion is of the, the wing to the, um, to the body. And I can, I can tell right now that the, the length of the body, which is my measuring point here, it's, the, the wing is like one and a half bodies. So here's my, my body here. I'm gonna go out this far and then add a little more. And of course it, it I dot, dotted that out. So that's my, my first and most important measurement to get that, that shape right. And it, it kind of goes down quite a bit. And if I don't get it right, you can, you can go back over it. And then, so let's get your proportions right for the other one. It goes all the way over to the, to the hole. And then there are two, there, there are two wings four wing, hind wing on each side. So let's get the proportion of this four wing right here. What I'm gonna do is, again, it's like just over, it's, it's more than a body's length. So that's too short. That dot is too short. So I'm gonna bring this down to here. And then see if I've got my proportions right. And it's okay to, to, to redo it and um, extend your lines. That's fine. So that's, I think that's, I'm gonna leave that for the moment for the four wing. I think it might be a little bit wide um, but I'm going to go with it. And now I'm going to, I'm um, sketching the, the hind wing. See, I changed my, changed it a little bit because I didn't, didn't really like that. So that, that's a, a, Good start on this shape there. And then I would repeat the same using my
See, I'm just um, mirroring the other one. The bod the, the ends of their wings are a little bit wavy. Um, not perfectly smooth. Then I don't I, I probably wouldn't have time even in the field. I, I depending I might not take um, the full time. I might just do the pattern on one side and then I can go back later and finish the pattern. But let's let's get the body in here. And I'm going to go ahead and you see that feathery bits there. So I'm not gonna make that completely black. And leaving those white spots. And the eyes. And notice how the antenna kind of dipped down. And have little, little, little bit of brushes on the end. Then to get, oh, let's finish doing the body. Um, the white's not showing in the um, the video, but but I've left white dots here, and I can um, enhance those using either uh, a white gel pen or a, a white gouache as well. So there's little so I think that's enough pen work that I'm going to do right now because I'll probably go in and use uh, either black watercolor or um, a combination of ink and watercolor. But I, I don't want to make it solid black because that would be flat. So I'm going to try to keep this fuzziness here. And then I'll mark the pattern. And this is a bit of a challenge. Doing this live would be hard, so you'd probably end up um, doing it from a guidebook or something. But I'm going to um, rough in the, um, the orange shapes. And each one is slightly different. It's interesting. And these spots um, vary as well. I've noticed they all have them, but it's, it's not perfect on each one. And so what I want to do as well, and this is very much of monarchs have this is these double rows of the dots on the wings. So before I, I color these in, I will make sure I reserve the white as well. And there's more waviness here. And let's get these. Um, I think what I'm going to do with this is actually, rather than draw the negative space, I'm going to go ahead and draw the veins here.
And it's not exact here. I'm, if I wanted to take my time and do a scientific illustration, that would take a really long time. Um, so I'm, I'm really just enjoying studying monarch physiology here and maybe asking some questions about why it's color patterned this way. So now I could go in and um, color these, just put in a, a orange wash, making this a little lighter than that and, and reserving the, the dots over here and leave this till later. So if you'll remember, one of the things that we, we remarked um, is that uh, there were so many other species and one of my favorites was was that that beetle but i want to show you just a quick tip what i almost always do when i go to a new area well any area well, area but especially where i'm i'm um, really enjoying um, diving into some place like like this is that i'll start a list and so i'm going to do it over on the side here and let's let's go ahead and i'm going to go ahead and make it go behind here and call it um, species observed. Boy, my handwriting got really bad there. Um, visiting milkweed. And I might just, I, I usually just, I don't draw it all the way down because I don't know exactly how long it's going to be, the list. Um, so, but what I might do is, is like just start writing in. So we saw a Western tiger swallowtail. We saw blue milkweed. Beetle. Uh, we saw ant species. We saw various, we'll just call them bumble <laughs> bees. Lots of different carpenter bees, all sorts of different, different bees. Um, possibly, and then here I'll put a question mark. Um, what was that? Uh, nine, nine spotted moth, not sure, um, saw a sphinx moth, and so on. So you would just keep your, your running list there. And um, so another fun thing we might want to want to draw as well, because they're just so fun to draw. Um, oh, right. Uh, before I move on, I want to draw the beetle, because doing iridescence is super fun. I won't have time to do a complete tutorial of the of iridescence um, because you have to let everything dry completely in between and there's about five layers. But um, I definitely wanna put that beetle in here so I can go back. But remember when I was talking about the, um, how monarchs um, fl fly, uh, it would be really fun to depict in your notebook uh, that flap, flap glide. So, so let's try to do that. Um, so, what I was observing is that they go flap, 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 glide, and then flap, 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 glide. Like that. Maybe that works. And then if, if we, maybe just for fun, we put, um, here's, a, here's a flapping butterfly. And then here's a, let's do a gliding butterfly. <laughs> to just do a miniature glide. I can color those orange and, and that, but that's fun. And that's, that gives you some more information. And if you had time to sit and observe, you could keep a tally of um, um, how many flaps. So 
So like, so say I'm observing now, I could go um, one, two, three, four. Okay, here's another one. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, one, two, three, then he glides. I'm totally making this up, but this is how, how you might approach it. One, two, three, four, oop, five, six. So that would be fun to just see what you ended up with as an average. Um, so let's, let's throw this beetle in here because beetles are cool. These are beautiful. So what I would do for this page, so you could take more notes in here, um, more, more words, but let's, um, I think what I would do is, is to pull it out as a, in a circle. I'm gonna, ooh, I'm, I'm doing this freehand, <laughs> kind of an oval circle. Um, and then let's, let's get this beetle guy in here. I'm just going to roughly it's got these it's kind of shield shape so I'm just drawing the shape now I'm not there and then you can see the the split of the wing And then his head. You see how I'm just, you know, I'm just feeling out the shape with my pen until it until it feels right. These would be super fun to draw in live. And you could take a photo and bring it back. Um, to work on later too, because do it, like I said, during iridescence with them. Um, out in the field would be kind of hard. Um, now what I would want to do is also mark where the, the leg, leg attachments are because you got to get those right or it looks kind of weird. So that's up here and then way up at the top there. Um, so let's just do these representations of the, the legs and get this Oop, I didn't quite get that back far enough. So that's okay. This one, you're just seeing the, the top of it. Barely see it coming down there. And then here's fun. We could do the, um, make the antennae come off the, out of the circle. It's always fun to kind of break your circles or squares and don't have the, the tyranny of the solid. Um, the antennae are kind of segmented. So I'm just kind of dotting those in right now. So then I would write in um, the species name. So this is the um, milkweed beetle. Oh, sorry, this is the blue milkweed beetle. And then maybe here I put the Latin name, which is Chrysocus cobaltinus. Fun. Like so. And then um, we can we can get a start on. Let's see, it's four minutes till 11. Um, I, I can give you a couple of quick color tips. So what I would 
what I would do is go in, I'll do my, my lovely greens and, and do my, my pinks in here to, to show that. I would probably throw some blue in here and, um, and have fun with that. Uh, then get my nice oranges with the, the deeper orange here and the lighter orange here just slightly. And then for, um, to do iridescence. So John Muir Laws has an absolutely fantastic uh, iridescence tutorial in, in his Laws Guide to Nature Journaling. And so you'll definitely want to refer to that. I think he's got videos on the website too, but I found that the, the tutorial in the, um, the book has, has really great information. Uh, and what you need are some specific colors because you need to lay down the, the, the greens and purpley blues first in a staining watercolor because what you do is, and you use phthalo uh, green and phthalo blue, that's, those are watercolor colors. And you, you lay in, and here I did a, a, uh, a practice here just starting out using phthalo green there um, and let, let that dry. And then, and then you start building up the dark over it just a little bit at a time using um, the ultramarine, ultramarine blue mixed with uh, burnt sienna. And what that is is Payne's gray, if you have Payne's gray and you wet it again and you lay that over it and let it dry and then keep building up um, until you can, you get these areas of different colors. And um, I'll, I'll be doing a, a full tutorial on that soon, but it's, um, it's a lot of fun to do. Um, I I'm, don't have a full time to, to color this for you, but what I'll do is color it this afternoon and then post it on the website um, of what the finished would be. But let's continue our, our field trip because there's more to see and more to learn. And we'll look at other ways that we can also record things, more, more things. So, whew, um, it always just amazes me how, how time flies. Literally, right? Um, so let's, let's continue our, our safari uh, because it's, it's really, really fun. We're going to continue on and learn. This is, um, now we're going to go really deep because now we get to see, we're going to watch a caterpillar turn into a chrysalis, turn into a butterfly and fly to Mexico. So let's watch and just observe, take notes in your notebook if you want. Think about things you might want to sketch, but let's really just dig deep here on monarchs and enjoy learning. Now these recordings are sp going to be sped up a lot so that you can see the process, but this is super cool, amazing. All right, watch this. Oh my gosh. Truly amazing. And there we have a monarch chrysalis.
it's really, really amazing to watch this. Um, if you've ever grown out a chrysalis to a butterfly, but it becomes transparent and it starts dripping fluid as well. And then it starts breaking open. Again, this is um, sped up a huge amount. It's, it takes quite a bit of time. Somebody asked in chat if you know how long this process takes. I'll have to look. I, I the the butterflies I've I've grown out. Um, I, the the emergence um, took about four hours for the one that I the ones that I've done. Uh, but I've not done monarchs. Um, I bet it's similar. Uh, we can we can double check that. And then the the time in the chrysalis varies as well from species to species. But you can see that that it's got really fluid filled thorax and that pumping it now up into the wings. Um, and then it takes a long time for the wings to harden uh, to the point where it can fly. So that's another thing that takes a long time. So that took probably all day before the butterflies that we've done. I've done pipe vine swallowtails mostly um, here in Arizona um, before it's hard enough. There's some lovely close ups here, uh, which I'll, I'll be posting you know, this on, on, online. You can go back so you can like stop the screen during these close-ups, which would be super fun to do a, a, a micro view sketch here. Look at that. It looks like, you know, dot matrix. It's, it's amazing. All those, those parts on the, the wing that make up the pattern. And so here it's flexing its wings, getting it dried out. Um, you can really see the the feathery bits on the on the abdomen on those those spots on the underside of the thorax. It's just really cool. So you notice the pattern on that one is really different than the one we drew. And you can see the lighter color underneath and the slightly lighter hind wing on on the surface on the on the top. And there he goes. And he's heading to Mexico. <laughs> no, he'll be eating and, and may have another generation to go before, before they head um, to Mexico, which is interesting uh, in and of itself. But they are heading now, uh, right now, monarchs are on migration. And here we go, we're going to leave Yosemite. So it can take four generations for a monarch to pass its genes and, and head to, to its migratory route. And here's the, the biosphere reserve. Those are butterflies covering those trees. And this footage by PBS Nature was taken with a little clever little drone disguised as a hummingbird. You'll see it in a minute. That's the camera. So it was able to get up into this area and not disturb the monarchs because they coexist with hummingbirds all the time. So this is truly one of the wonders of the world. Millions and millions of butterflies. They warm up, they'll fly, feed, come back and roost. This is definitely one of the things I'd like to see on my list. Um, they're very endangered. Uh, it, the habitat is endangered due to illegal logging, to uh, non, the, the tourism that hasn't been regulated properly, and, uh, and then pesticides and clearing of the forest. So uh, these are, that's it. So I hope you enjoyed that, that fun little, um, we did make it to Mexico. 
and I hope uh, it would be really cool to get to go down there someday. But um, I think we're going to wrap up because we said 11.15. So um, I know we all have things to do on our holiday weekend. So thank you for joining us. Grace is going to finish up here and then I will see you next time. So Grace. So I'd like to point your attention in the chat. I posted a link. If you enjoyed this um, workshop, uh, please consider contributing at the chip in the tip jar. I posted the link in chat. So, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.